Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, Happy New Year to, uh, to all of you. It's my distinct honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for the first internal medicine grand rounds of 2021, Dr. Kim Eagle, who is the Albion Walter Hewlett Professor of Internal Medicine, Professor of Health Management and Policy at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and Director of the Frankel Cardiovascular Center at the University of Michigan Health System. Dr. Eagle received his MD from Tufts University, followed by residency and chief residency in internal medicine at Yale New Haven Hospital. He then completed both research and clinical fellowships in cardiology and health services research at Harvard Medical School in Mass General. After serving as associate professor of medicine at Harvard and associate director of the clinical cardiology at Mass Gen Hospital, Dr. Eagle moved to the University of Michigan, where he continued to make impactful contributions to medicine and health management and policy. Some examples of his work include developing an outcomes research program focusing on quality, practice guidelines, acute coronary syndromes, treatment of aortic diseases, the fight against childhood obesity. He, in fact, founded Project, Health, uh, Project Healthy Schools, among many other accomplishments. Dr. Eagle's clinical excellence is also paralleled by an exceptional research career with over 730 peer-reviewed publications in top-tier journals, 74 book chapters, and eight books. Uh, that's not counting his CV, which, in my opinion, may well qualify as a book. He received the 2018 Distinguished Scientist Award in the clinical domain from the American College of Cardiology. As an educator, Dr. Eagle received the American College of Cardiology's Master Designation in 2009, Distinguished Teacher Award in 2012, and the American Heart Association's Linux Society's Clinician Educator Award in 2013. Dr. Eagle's service to the community at large and his own institution are no less, as he served on countless boards and advisory committees for the NIH, AHA, ACC, and is past president of the Association of University Cardiologists. It comes as no surprise that the University of Michigan created the Kim A. Eagle Professorship in Cardiovascular Medicine and an endowed research fund bearing Dr. Eagle's name in 2014. The title of Dr. Eagle's talk today is Cardiac Risk of Non-Cardiac Surgery, Peace of My Mind. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eagle. Dr. Eagle. Thank you very much. Um, hope you can hear me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. I would have liked that very much, but uh, hopefully uh, maybe you'll invite me back when things are a little different than they are today. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot today, but if you want my slides, I'm happy to send them to you. My email is listed here, keagle at umich.edu. Also, I do a lot of teaching on Twitter for ACC. If you want to follow me there, at keagle.md. Would love to have you uh, following me on Twitter and interact uh, that way. So I've been studying cardiac risk of non-cardiac surgery for a long time, 35 plus years. And today I'm going to give you a piece of my mind based on this 35-year uh, journey. Uh, next slide. As far as I know, I won't be talking about anything that would have uh, any financial implications, but if you know anybody who's interested in funding my research in this area, please send them my way. Next slide. So this is the outline. I'm gonna start with a rant. Then I'm gonna give you uh, a lesson in history, a lesson in research, a personal confession, and then a personal reflection. Um, I hazard to guess, you probably have never seen an outline like this, and let's see um, how you feel when I'm done. Next slide. So this is my rant. This is like a, an email or, or note that I get virtually every day, clear this patient for surgery. Sometimes the surgeon or anesthesiologist will go even further to say, failure to do so in a timely way will cause this patient to have their surgery canceled. This drives me nuts. Um, I want to say I'm not a clearance house. I'm a person who can assess cardiovascular function, physiology, and reserve. But asking me to clear something seems like a legal argument. So if something bad happens, it's on my watch. That's my rant. I've stopped fighting this. I clear patients every day. But it does drive me a little batty, I must admit. Next slide. Um, I love this pre-op clearance. I don't need that. My doctor tells me I'm the healthiest president in the US history. Pre-op clearance is for losers. Well, you know, 
pre-op clearance uh, is is truly an art form, and I hope after today, at least you'll have some way of uh, thinking about it from the point of view of the heart. And the next slide. So I think it's always useful to look back and see what's behind us. And I want to take the next few minutes to talk about kind of the history of the current era of perioperative assessment of cardiac risk for non-cardiac surgery. Next slide. These are kind of in the modern era, I would say the three, I'm sorry, the four indices that um, have been talked about and have, have been of value to us as we think about cardiac risk. Uh, the first came in the 70s by Lee Goldman, uh, multivariable risk assessment of patients before non-cardiac surgery with a focus on the heart. Uh, Alan Detsky subsequently with, I think, a very uh, important index, which included things like age, type of operation, things like that. The work that I did in the, in the mid 80s was the notion of using clinical markers and then selected stress testing to further clarify risk. And finally, the revised cardiac risk index, which I think many of us still use, uh, published by Tom Lee, uh, 1999, this is 20 years old, isn't it? So high risk surgery, known ischemic heart disease, prior heart failure, history of cerebral vascular disease, uh, diabetics, particularly those on insulin, and abnormal renal function. Simple index, you can count it on the number of fingers in your hand, and it is quite useful in assessing risk. Next slide. So Louis Pasteur said chance favors a prepared mind. And when I was training in cardiology, I was studying Bayes' theorem at the Harvard School of Public Health and stress testing at the Mass General Hospital. And at that time, it just so happened that myocardial perfusion imaging, then using thallium, first became introduced in the space of preoperative testing. And the first big paper was a New England Journal blockbuster study, uh, but it was all patients who had vascular disease, so they were high risk. And I was studying Bayes' theorem and how the notion that when you apply a test to a low risk population, oftentimes the test is meaningless. So let's go to the next slide. And we did a simple study where we looked at patients having vascular surgery and asked the question, do they have any of these markers of risk, history of angina, prior MI, prior known heart failure, diabetes, or a Q wave on their EKG? And then they all had uh, cardiac stress testing with diprotomal thallium imaging. And we divided the group into those that had no risk factors, that's on the left-hand side of the slide, and those that had one or more markers, those are on the right. And importantly, I think what you note is the low risk group on the left, low clinical risk, even if they had evidence of stress test abnormalities, had very low risk, uh, no MIs, no deaths. Contrarywise, on the right-hand side of the screen, you see that patients who had one or more of those risk markers, who had a evidence of ischemia, a reversible defect on thallium, that's where the events were. There were seven events in that group. Now, interestingly, this is a, you know, this is an analysis of a group of patients that I actually studied when I was a fellow. And my mentor said, Kim, this is nice, but it's worthless. Uh, it's a small number of patients. And uh, you know, I think I would just let it go. And I said, well, potentially, you know, this is a hugely expensive test. And diprotomal thallium imaging may become a very popular test around the country for all kinds of things. I think we should do a validation sample and see if we can't publish it. And he said, well, I, th I think the numbers are too small, but go ahead. And the next slide is a group of 50 patients, which basically proved the same thing. The low risk patients on the left, 23 of them, even though a number of them had ischemia on the treadmill, uh, none of them had an event. And on the right, if you had both markers of risk and a positive stress test, that was a problem. And I said, you know, to him, Danny Singer, I said, I wanna send this to JAMA. And he said, they'll never take it. And ironically, it was a perfect storm because this was a moment when we were really starting to think about how much testing do we really need to do? Uh, and they took it right away. Um, and it's an example of a simple study which has immediate clinical impact uh, that we can use when we take care of patients. Next slide. So this is how I currently think about preoperative assessment. Uh, clinical markers we've talked about. 
what is a patient's functional status, and then what is relevant about surgery-specific risk. That helps us reach a branch point where we decide, should we proceed with surgery uh, without anything else, or are we worried about something that might be uh, might affect their care one way or the other. So this is how I like to think about uh, preoperative assessment for, for cardiac uh, disease in patients having non-cardiac surgery. Next slide. Um, and so we're gonna talk about the guidelines and guidelines are just guidelines, right? They give us a general idea of where we should go. Um, the guidelines, however, cannot deal with every nuance that we face. And that's where being a good doctor really matters. Next slide. The risk, and the risk indices that I like to use, I, I like the revised cardiac risk index, which includes the type of surgery, known ischemic heart disease, prior heart failure of any type, prior cerebrovascular disease, uh, pre-op insulin treatment, long-standing diabetics particularly, and elevated creatinine. It's a very simple tool uh, and it has stood the test of time and it's been validated and I think is still relevant. Next slide. It's a very large study of uh, 10 million patients showing that the revised cardiac risk index as you go from a score of zero up to a score of, of five or more of those markers does correlate clearly with uh, risk, including death, uh, non-fatal MI and stroke. So this, this is a tool that I continue to value in my clinic. Next slide. Um, let's ask the question, um, how could risk assessment and preoperative moment actually lead to an improved outcome? Because that's really what we're talking about, isn't it? And I think it's a useful exercise because then it asks the question, well, what could we find that we can actually do something about? Uh, and that would include finding and treating systolic heart failure, finding and treating new or unstable coronary disease, finding and treating symptomatic arrhythmias, finding and treating symptomatic valve disease, uh, potentially finding and treating stable ischemic heart disease, and sometimes canceling uh, an operation that has high risk. And when you're suddenly talking to the patient about cardiovascular issues, you know, suddenly they say, you know, my knee's starting to feel a little better uh, when you talk about the need to maybe study my heart and do other things that perhaps sound less scary than the limp that I have from osteoarthritis. Next slide. Functional status is really, really helpful. It really gives us a sense, a tape measure of cardiovascular and pulmonary reserve that patients have in their daily life. So patients that can regularly exercise at a high level are at a very low risk of most types of non-cardiac surgery. Contrarywise, patients who are couch potatoes and don't do much in their daily life, we really have no idea what their cardiovascular reserve is. Uh, and so we use functional status very much in terms of trying to get a general notion of a patient's cardiovascular function and reserve. Next slide. If you ask a patient, uh, can you walk four blocks or climb two flights of stairs? Very simple question. If they say, no, I can't do that, their cardiovascular risk is two times higher than a patient who says, yeah, I can do that, no problem, all the time. A simple example of how functional status can be helpful in the preoperative moment. And you have to tease this out. You know, if, if you ask a patient, do you exercise? And they say no, then immediately I go to the question, well, what do you do? Do you take the garbage out? Do you ever carry the bags in the grocery store? What, what's the most physically uh, stressful thing that you do? And that can often give you a sense for what they can do. Uh, and sometimes when you get that, then they'll also give you a symptom that they didn't otherwise report. Oh yeah, doc, I walk a quarter of a mile to the mailbox. Sometimes on the way back, I get a little chest tightness. I assume that was my asthma, right? Well, might be, but it could be coronary disease that hasn't been di diagnosed yet. Next slide. And this is the, the Duke Activity Scale Index that I think is so helpful in terms of teasing out, you know, what type of activity is related to uh, energy expenditure. And in the guidelines, we've used, uh, you know, patients who can do more than four metabolic equivalents on a routine basis without symptoms are at lower risk. This is not a cut point. It's a, it's a, you know, obviously it's a trend, but the higher the exercise accomplishments patients have in daily life, the lower their cardiovascular risk for non-cardiac surgery. 
Next slide. Um, this is, I think, the first major take home message I want to have you think about, and that is that a prior stroke is a very important marker for cardiovascular risk for non cardiac surgery. Uh, you see, of course, in this slide that a recent stroke predicts subsequent stroke. But what is less known is that a recent stroke also predicts cardiovascular risk and mortality after non cardiac surgery. So, a patient who's had a stroke within three months, three to six months, we definitely want to delay elective non-cardiac surgery uh, because their cardiac risk is higher. Next slide. And there are several mechanisms for this, uh, and it looks like a stroke is related to um, subsequent inflammation that may rev up atherosclerosis in other regions, including the heart. Next slide includes another uh, study looking at the release of alarmins in the brain after a stroke. And I think there might be one more citation here, which uh, basically gives mechanisms. But the point is, acute stroke probably uh, leads to inflammation that may cause vulnerability of plaque in the heart. Similarly, we think that acute MI may lead to vulnerability of plaque in the brain. Next slide. This shows you the surgery specific risk in this very large study reported a few years ago. And we're gonna put vascular surgery as the highest risk followed by thoracic uh, and solid organ transplant. These would be what we would consider to be higher uh, surgical risk. Obviously the vascular procedure, uh, some of that risk has to do with the fact that a patient with atherosclerosis in a limb or a neck or an aorta may also have atherosclerotic disease in the heart. And so that relationship is important when we think about vascular surgery. Next slide. This is an important slide, another take home message related to that. And that is that lower extremity bypass surgery is every bit as, as scary as uh, aortic aneurysm repair. And I like to think about this in terms of the fact that the patient who has limiting claudication or a non-healing ulcer has severe atherosclerosis in the lower limb, and they tend to have worse atherosclerosis in the heart. Contrarywise, a AAA repair, particularly an open operation, is very stressful. That's a more stressful operation for the patient, but that patient may have a little less, on average, atherosclerotic burden in the heart than the patient who has terrible peripheral vascular disease, particularly the smokers and diabetics. So lower extremity bypass surgery or amputation those are high risk operations, even though you would think that the relative stress of that procedure is lower. It's the risk of the patient in that circumstance. Next slide. Contrary wise, um, things like total knee replacement in active people is a very low risk operation. This is a study looking at the United Kingdom, a whole year of knee replacements in the United Kingdom. And the 30-day mortality for a total knee replacement was less than half a percent. And I want to simply argue with you that if you think about a patient having this type of operation who is perfectly fine, the value of screening them for at least perioperative management is really pretty hard to justify because they do well. They just simply do well unless they report recent onset of angina or symptoms of failure or symptomatic arrhythmias, for example. So screening for low risk surgery, like I showed you before, makes no sense in 2021. Next slide. And this is just a study that shows you across the different types of surgery. When you use the revised cardiac risk index, the risk goes up and especially the vascular surgery group with more markers, they have the more higher risk uh, than uh, patients who are having a lower risk type of operations. Next slide. So this is how I currently approach my patients. I'm looking for evidence of prior coronary disease, prior heart failure, diabetics, renal insufficiency, recent stroke. All of those have a hazard ratio of two to three, poor functional capacity, less than four mets in daily life, hazard ratio about two, and the type of really high risk surgeries we talk about hazard ratio of about three. This is a very simple framework where markers, function, surgery, leads you to an overall assessment of their risk. 
Next slide. Now, if you want to get more complicated, be my guest. Uh, this is a study uh, looking at the uh, NISQIP uh, database, which you can get online and you see it here. This is a, a national quality forum effort to define cardiovascular risk. And you can plug in uh, roughly uh, 15 to 30 variables and get a fairly precise estimate of uh, risk associated with various types of operations in our patients. Um, it takes obviously more time, the revised cardiac risk index, but it's, it's a little more precise. And if you look at the area under the curve, it's a little better than the revised cardiac risk index. And occasionally I will use this, but generally not. I usually use the, the simpler uh, tool that we've talked about before. Next slide. There's a newer risk index that was published just in the last uh, year or so um, called the CVRI, the Cardiovascular Risk Index. It includes things that are familiar to you, advanced age, uh, any history of heart disease, angina or dyspnea, uh, vascular surgery, emergency surgery, and then this curious one, the hemoglobin, uh, less than 12, which is potentially an actionable variable. We, don't know, we certainly don't know, however, uh, transfusing to a hemoglobin above 12 has any value. And in fact, I think it's hard to argue that it does, but it may imply a patient with more chronic disease of various types uh, that, that we sometimes see. Next slide. And this just shows you the, the validation of that uh, CVRI and, and compared it to the NISQIP database and they're fairly comparable. Next slide. Okay, so let's go back. What is the most important preoperative test? And the answer is on the next slide. It's a careful, thorough, preoperative history, physical exam, and a review of ECG and recent tests. Uh, there probably is no area in medicine where uh, the art of medicine, that is an excellent history physical exam, assessment of labs and EKG is more important than here. Next slide. These are the conditions that we're trying to find when we do that history and physical in the preoperative clinic. We wanna find unstable or new coronary syndromes. We wanna find new or decompensated heart failure. We wanna find symptomatic arrhythmias. We wanna find significant valvular heart disease. These are usually adequately assessed by a great history and physical. It's a rare patient who is harboring a fairly dangerous problem that you can't tease out from a very careful history and physical. Next slide. Let's talk about heart failure. Um, when we see a patient preoperatively with a history of heart failure, it's paramount that we understand the etiology. Is it heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Is it heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Are they one of those rare patients that has heart failure due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction? Um, these are very important to know because the treatment for these is vastly different. F ref, reduced EF, we would, in a patient who's in trouble, we would diurese and we might give a patient like that an inotrope. Contrarywise, if they have hypertrophic disease with obstruction, diuresing and giving them an inotrope might make them worse. So when you see a patient in the pre-op clinic facing a big operation and a history of heart failure, it's important that we understand the etiology uh, because that can make all the difference in planning therapy, both for the short term and also the long term. Next slide. And this shows you uh, basically the hazard ratio uh, for patients with different types of heart failure. And I'll just call your attention to the fact that the patient with severely reduced EF under 30% the hazard ratio is about eight compared to the patient with HEF-PEF where the hazard ratio of a complication is about four. And of course, being symptomatic with heart failure compared to patients who have asymptomatic cardiomyopathies ups the ante in terms of risk a lot. Next slide. Okay, let's think about uh, coronary disease and the next slide. Um, this gets into kind of my personal confession when I was training a thousand years ago, we thought that if we found coronary disease and fixed it, that patients would get better. This was basically coronary plumbing 101. And much of the early research that I was involved with was focused on trying to understand this possibility. Next slide. 
So let's start by looking at non-cardiac uh, surgery and the value of stress testing. And I wanna start with vascular surgery because that's a high risk condition, lots of heart disease. And I wanna ask the question, how good are our tests for identifying patients who are gonna have a complication, MI or death? And this is a study we published looking at that. And it basically showed that whether you do myocardial perfusion imaging or stress echo, the sensitivity of these tests to identify a patient is gonna have an important outcome, MI or death, is only about 85%. That is, they miss one out of six. Next slide. And just go to the next slide. If you then ask the question, well, if they have ischemia, if we do a preoperative stress test that shows ischemia using myocardial perfusion, what's the positive predictive value of that? And the answer is it's not very good. Only one out of eight actually has an event, and this is vascular surgery. So. What I'm telling you today is that in a stable patient, preoperative screening with ischemia-based imaging has a sensitivity for events that matter, MI or death, that's relatively modest, and that the positive predictive value of finding ischemia in a stable patient ain't very high. That's important when we start thinking about Bayesian analysis of preoperative screening. Next slide. And the next. Stress echo, same, next slide, and next. So again, we see that even a positive stress echo has a positive predictive value of only about 20%. Only one out of five is gonna have an event. Next slide. All right, so if we're gonna do stress testing, let's say we have a patient who has some wonky symptoms and we're worried and they have some moderate type of risk. Let's say they've had a prior MI, they're a diabetic. And let's say they're facing a big operation and we're really unclear about where they're at in terms of their cardiovascular situation. We have to think about which type of test we would do. And the first thing would be to say, if they can exercise, we should have them exercise because the best predictor of death on a treadmill stress test is how long they, they actually are able to exercise. So exercise testing is always preferred in a patient who has the ability to exercise. If they can't, then we'll have to do pharmacologic testing. If you're worried about valve disease as well, we can do stress echo. If you're worried about um, uh, a quantifying muscle at risk in the territory of the anterior wall, for example, we use myocardial perfusion imaging, the nuclear technique. Both types of stress testing give us information about left ventricular performance. So either one of those is fine. Next slide. And uh, this, this slide looks at the question, what about coronary CT? And clearly, if you look at the uh, patients who have a lot of coronary calcium or extensive obstruction on a coronary CT, they have higher risk for coronary events. But how to filter this type of information into preoperative assessment is very challenging. Uh, probably high calcium score adds hazard. Uh, evident of coronary artery disease on CT angi angiography adds to the hazard ratio. But incorporating these into routine care is difficult and it involves radiation. And if you find blockage, okay, so what do you do now? Sometimes you get a stress test. Uh, and so using these tools, I think, is in a routine basis is not appropriate. They're probably are reasonable for certain patients, but not commonly. Next slide. So there's a lesson in history, uh, Reverend Bayes. Um, Reverend Bayes was a reverend by day and a mathematician at night. And his singular contribution, at least to this field, would be the notion that the likelihood of an event in a patient starts with their baseline risk, which is then modified up or down by a test. Okay, so the prior probability test revised probability. And I wanna give you an example of this that I think uh, hits us right home with, with this uh, lesson. Next slide. There's a study that we did, which was a study of about 1,100 patients who were having abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. Uh, and they were divided into their clinical risk that we talked about low, moderate, or high, no markers, one or two, three or more. They all had a stress test. And then the test was analyzed as to the amount of ischemia, low risk, moderate risk, high risk, based on the amount of abnormality. And if you look on the left-hand side of this slide, this is about a third of the patients 
who were low clinical risk, they had none of the markers we talked about, they went ahead and had their stress test. And you see that if the stress test was low probability, their event rate was 3%. If it was high probability, the event rate was 0%. And in the middle was the moderate risk test where the event rate was 3%. And you'd say, well, stress thallium imaging doesn't work. And Reverend Bayes would slap you on the head and say, no, 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 I told you low risk was low risk. You didn't need to test this patient and because of the operating characteristics of the test, it is not useful and sometimes, frankly, it's confusing. The right-hand side of this slide also illustrates the other point that Bayes would make, and that here's a patient with high risk. Let's say it's a person who has four markers. They're 84, they have angina, they have diabetes, and they have heart failure. They have mar multiple markers of risk. So even if they uh, have a low risk test, that is no ischemia, you see the event rate there is 12%. And if they have positive ischemia, high risk, it only doubles to 24%. High risk is high risk. 12% is a high risk. That's one chance out of eight that Mrs. Jones is gonna have a heart attack or death. And I'm not sure the stress test helped us very much. In this particular example, the place where the test had best use was the moderate risk group. And that's right in the middle. Half the patients had moderate risk, one or two markers. And those who had a negative stress test, that's on the lower left there in the middle, they had an event rate of 3%. If they had a very abnormal stress test, the event rate went up to 18%. So a six-fold movement from pre-test to post-test. And that might be enough of a change that you say, you know, that's useful to me because if they have a borderline aneurysm, I might decide to follow that a bit longer, or if they have claudication that's fairly limiting but not severe, maybe I'll just stop where we're at and we won't go down that road unless we get to a more troubling place. So this is a really good example of how Bayes theorem operates in the preoperative space, particularly surrounding stress testing before vascular surgery. Next slide. So one of the things that I want you to think about is the notion that we should avoid cardiovascular testing for patients having low risk surgery. We have been overdoing it. It is not helpful. It rarely finds something really bad. And so I think increasingly we're moving away from this. A very good history and physical and EKG and lab assessment. Patient who's functionally active with normal EKG, no evidence of trouble, they usually do very well through non-cardiac surgery. Next slide. Should you do a pre-op consult before cataract repair? I think the risk of me dying is probably higher walking across the street than having a cataract taken out. Next slide. And yet, in the early 2000s, what we saw, the number of patients getting a pre-op consult before cataract surgery steadily rose. What are we doing? Is this just lit a litigious society where we're covering our rear ends before cataract repair? Come on. The risk of a stress test may be as high as the risk of having a cataract taken out. Next slide. And when we look at the, the, the things like um, you know, a surgical procedure like knee operation or cataract surgery or arthroscopy, you know, the event rates uh, are low, but the screening continues to be pretty high. You know, this, this looks at the number of patients having a stress test uh, before different types of surgery. The VA population, which is a capitated group, of course, there's no financial incentive to do stress testing. In the Medicare population, um, there's a higher incentive and we see more of it. I don't think it's usually necessary. We've overdone it on the stress testing side for years and years. Next slide. So what causes troubling cardiovascular events? I would submit that it's catechol surges, prothrombotic environment, blood loss, major volume shifts, coronary plaque destabilization, and fixed coronary disease. And I put this slide in because I want you to realize that stress testing can only predict one of these. It doesn't tell you who's gonna bleed. It doesn't tell you who's gonna have a soft plaque in a coronary that ruptures. So the notion that stress testing is gonna really tell us all we need to know about what may happen perioperatively is a myth. It can be a value, yes, in certain patients but we've oversold it. And I'm trying to teach you today not to sell it so much. Next slide. 
The catechol surges after surgery are real. Norepinephrine goes up, epinephrine goes up. And after vascular surgery, norepinephrine stays up seven, 14 days. This, of course, drives blood pressure and it can drive plaque rupture, et cetera. Next slide. If you ask the question, well, who has the really troubling perioperative events, that is fatal heart attack, this is who they are. We studied the coronary pathology of 42 patients who suffered fatal non-cardiac or fatal MI after non-cardiac surgery. And you see here, 20% had left main disease, about 60% had triple vessel disease. Most of the rest had two vessel in disease involving the LAD, proximal LED. And most of these were known. They had coronary disease that was known. Interesting, there are two patients here that had no coronary disease. They were both women who had hysterectomy, suffered a, suffered a fatal postoperative anterior MI. Their coronaries were clear. At the time, we didn't know what to call them. Today, we would call them the Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, stress-induced cardiomyopathy that can happen more often in women, uh, particularly if they have risk factors like hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Now, we did another thing in this study that's important. That is, we looked at the culprit lesion for the MI. And we asked ourselves, if we had done a cardiac cath and had done an angioplasty or stent with the most severe coronary blockage that we could see, how often would it have been the place that caused the MI? And the answer was less than half the time. This gets at the question that atherosclerosis is often a fairly diffuse process. And even if we do a cath that finds a 70% lesion, we have no clue if that's going to be the lesion that causes the postoperative MI from plaque rupture. It may be something in a different coronary territory that's 40% where the plaque ruptures. So this notion that we can use the anatomy to predict what to do to prevent infarcts is simply a myth. It's not true. There's some degree of relationship, but it's not nearly as tight as we thought. Next slide. So let's talk about the medical therapy that have been tried to reduce perioperative events, beta blockers, statins, aspirin, clonidine, and the use of swan gans catheters for monitoring. Let's go to the beta blockers first. Next slide. Uh, Mangano and colleagues uh, showed many years ago that it looked like if you give veterans who often had coronary disease a beta blocker prior to non-cardiac surgery, that it looked like we reduced perioperative ischemia and potentially MI out at six months. And this logic, of course, flows from our logic of coronary disease in general. After an MI, we like to have patients on beta blockers for at least three years. And beta blockers are her first choice of treatment for anti-anginal treatment in patients with stable CAD. So the notion that beta blockers might reduce perioperative events is not illogical at all. And this study started the storm uh, many years ago. Next slide. Then came the decrease study where patients having elective aortic surgery were randomized if they had markers of risk uh, to get either a beta blocker or placebo if they had ischemia on stress echo. So markers of risk, aortic surgery, demonstrated ischemia, randomized to beta blockers or placebo. And the next slide shows the results. And this showed that uh, if you got a beta blocker, bisoprolol, there was about an 80% risk reduction in MI or death. And I, I frankly, you know, this is New England Journal. I remember the first time I saw this curve, I thought, you know, that's almost too good to believe. I mean, there's nothing I've ever seen in cardiology that reduces your risk 85%. That's massive. Next slide. The other thing that this, this, this study done by Don Polderman suggested is that if you want to beta block them, Beta block them. That is, the patients who went to the OR with a lower heart rate did better. This was an observational post hoc analysis. Next slide. I always like to use a new drug before its effectiveness wears off. And this is true of beta blockers. Next slide. This was a study by Lindenauer, which looked at a Medicare database and asked the question. Among a large group of Medicare recipients who were having non-cardiac surgery, had known heart disease, was there benefit of beta blockers if they were having non-cardiac surgery? And the data suggested that there was a modest benefit 
you see here a risk reduction of maybe 10%, uh, perhaps 15%, nothing like the 85% that we saw in that first decreased trial. Next, uh, next slide. And in fact, Lindenauer went on to show that if you were simply uh, a diabetic or you had a prior MI, uh, it did not appear that beta blockers were of benefit. In fact, if you had none of the risk markers in this large Medicare data set, if you treated 208 patients, you caused an event. You didn't reduce events, you caused an event. And this began to give us the sense there could be a dark side of beta blockers. In this study, if you had you know, a relative a revised risk index of four, you see you treat 33 patients and prevent one event. That may be cost effective. Uh, but when you have one marker, zero markers, probably no benefit and maybe harm. Next slide. And this is simply illustrated here, uh, harm if you've got no markers, possibly benefit if you've got three or four. But remember, three or four markers, you probably got coronary disease and or systolic heart failure. Beta blockers work there. So yeah, duh, I knew that already. Next slide. One of the first duties of a physician is educate masses not to take medicines. This isn't, this isn't about vaccines, is it? Um, and the next slide illustrates this. Um, Diabetics randomized to getting beta blockers or not. These are patients without known ischemic heart disease, no benefit at all in lowering perioperative risk. So the notion that diabetes is a coronary equivalent in terms of beta blockers and perioperative, no, it's not. Next slide. Then came uh, the POISE trial. And the POISE investigators looked at the decreased trial and said, we're gonna, we're gonna treat a lot of patients we're gonna use high doses of beta blockers to get that heart rate down. We wanna get it under 60. And you see they randomized over 8,000 patients and they gave 100 milligrams of Toprol the night before and often the morning of surgery. And the main endpoint here was this combined endpoint cardiovascular death, MIR cardiac arrest. And what you see here in the second line of results, there was a benefit of beta blockers for this primary endpoint. However, they also had an, a secondary endpoint called death. Next slide. And if you look at the risk of death, beta blockers correlated with a higher mortality. And the next slide shows you all cause mortality, the hazard ratio 1.16, cardiovascular mortality 1.10. In this study, high dose beta blockers in beta blocker virgins having non-cardiac surgery, beta blockers, ironically, were harmful. They reduced the risk of non-fatal of, of non MI, but they increased the risk of death. Next slide. And here you get it, if you treat 1,000 patients with doses like that, you prevent 12 MIs, six revascularizations, but what's the risk? 13 deaths and six strokes. Gosh, and I was one of the people thinking about this on the national quality committees, thinking about should we give everybody beta blockers? I'm so glad we didn't. And if you think about it, if you have a stable patient and perioperatively they, they start to bleed or get infected and they, have, they need a high heart rate to get the kind of cardiac output they need to get out of a problem and you've blocked that with beta blockers, then you've basically poisoned their exit door and they can't get out. That's what beta blockers can do if you get into trouble. Next slide. And the, if you looked in those the studies, the, the poison investigators, the hazard ratio, uh, the death was strokes and hypotension and low flow related MIs caused by, ironically, the therapy itself. Next slide. And I'm gonna go to the next slide. So who do I treat with beta blockers preoperatively? Well, there, this is just not rocket science. Patients with systolic heart failure should be on beta blockers already. Patients with recent MI should be on beta blockers already. If there's another indication, hypertension, SVT, et cetera, we should continue them. But otherwise, please don't start patients on beta blockers. They not only don't help, they might hurt. Next slide. Um, and this is a, the notion of, of, of prior MI. Next slide. So important to remember that, that patients who have uh, 
prior MI do probably accelerate atherosclerosis. And so if we can, we want to wait at least three months and preferably six in a recent MI before we have non-cardiac surgery. Okay, that's, that is an important fact that we want to pay attention to. Next slide. And let's go on. All right, so I think we've talked about this. Patients already on beta blockers for an appropriate reason will want to continue them. Very rarely I'll find a patient with a prior MI or systolic heart failure. I'm starting them on beta blockers preoperatively, but generally we're not, we're not going to start beta blockers for other reasons because they don't help, they may hurt. Next slide. Okay, statins. It's a randomized trial of patients having vascular surgery, suggesting that statins reduce perioperative events. And you'd say, well, duh, because the vascular surgery itself is an indication for statins, assuming it's atherosclerosis, and you'd be right. These patients should already have been on statins. Next slide. Here's a study Lindenauer did looking at Medicare patients, asking the question, if you went to the OR on lipid-lowering therapy, Medicare population, known CAD, it appeared that being on effective uh, anti-lipid anti therapy was beneficial hazard ratio reduction of about 35%. That's exactly what we see in general practice. Secondary prevention statins reduce risk about 35%. And they do that perioperatively too. Next slide. Uh, and let's go to the next one. Then came this study from Dr. Polgermans looking at fluvastatin versus placebo in lowering risk for non-cardiac surgery. And the risk reduction was 50% with a very weak statin. And the next slide shows that if you combine that with a beta blocker, this is a two by two trial, the right hand figure here suggested that if you're on fluvastatin and a beta blocker, the risk reduction is a whopping 65 to 70%. This study, along with that first study that I showed you, finally caused people to ask the question, is this too good to believe? Are these data too good to believe? Next slide. Subsequently, this is the lesson in research fraud. Dr. Poldermans um, was investigated by his university. Next slide. And the committee looked at all of the primary data for his trials, and there were six of them, I believe, and found that they were often negligent and scientifically incorrect. Frankly, I've never seen an area of medicine in at least the cardiovascular space more affected by research fraud than what was happening in the perioperative area with particularly beta blockers. Next slide. This shows you the various studies, the trials that were published in high profile journals. And look what happened here on the right. Uh, the endpoint uh, was fictitious. Uh, the source data didn't verify. Uh, the MI didn't happen. Uh, they didn't get the stress echo that they apparently were supposed to have gotten and was reported in the study. This is really a sad testimony uh, in the area of clinical research. And to me, it's a, it's a siren call for those of us involved in research to make sure that we're aware of the source data, that we're constantly pushing back with our teammates, especially when we see findings that seem just almost too good to believe. In this case, they were. They were falsified. Next slide. Um, we do think that statins lower risk in vascular surgery. They lower risk of death, MI, or stroke. And so I do use the statins, but the beta blocker story is a sad testimony. Uh, and if you think about the POISE trial, the number of people who died in that trial because of the beta blocker doses chosen, that all goes back to the Polderman's research and that low heart rate story. Next slide. So who should be on a statin? The usual indications, right? If they have atherosclerosis, known atherosclerosis, prior MI, prior stroke, PAD, uh, they should be on a bit of statin before non-cardiac surgery. And the effect can be right away. So if I find somebody today who merits statin, I'm gonna start them on it today because there's already vascular effects of statins one day after you start therapy. It's amazing what it does to vascular resistance right away. Next slide. Okay, what about aspirin? This is the POISE-2 trial, aspirin versus placebo. Um, no benefit. A baby aspirin does not prevent perioperative MIs uh, and you get more bleeding. 
So we do not want to use aspirin in a primary prevention role perioperatively. Next slide. In the one group here that was studied, um, recent PCI, probably I would continue the aspirin. This was within five years, I believe, particularly very recent PCI, I would continue the baby aspirin if possible. Otherwise, no, no clear benefit and there is harm, bleeding risk. What about clonidine? Next slide. Clonidine, we thought might reduce perioperative events in poise, it did not. No benefit at all. And there was harm, more hypotension. So clonidine did not stand the test, it's not helpful. Next slide. What about Swan-Gans catheters for very high risk patients? This was a randomized trial saying, let's put in a Swan before major surgery so we can monitor the wedge pressure and so forth. And in this study, there was no benefit at all. Uh, there was, there were four PEs in the group that got the Swan-Gans versus one in the group that did not. So we don't find the use of Swan-Gans catheters to lower major cardiovascular events. Sometimes a right heart cath itself is useful for estimating filling pressures, fine. But leaving a Swan-Gans catheter in, in the ICU for non-cardiac surgery, probably no value. Next slide. What about fixing the heart? Here's my confession, next slide. I thought that if you found coronary disease and fixed it, that we would lower risk, All right? This thinking goes back 30 years, next slide. I published a paper like this one from the CAS registry showing that if you had coronary disease and you'd gotten a cabbage, the risk of having an MI or death after non-cardiac surgery was lower. And that's true, but it ignores the, the, the fact that to get to the benefit, you had to get through the cabbage. Huh, yeah, gosh, I forgot. And cabbage has risk. Next slide. So this was studied in the CARP trial. Does immediate revascularization of the heart lower risk in patients having vascular surgery? Let's go to the next slide. And it was a nice study uh, done on the VA system. Patients with known ischemic heart disease got evaluated. They had stable disease, did not have super low EF, did not have left main disease or critical AS. They got randomized to either medical therapy or medical therapy plus coronary revascularization. Next slide. And this is the patients. These are veterans, uh, average age 65. You see they had coronary disease, diabetes, uh, and the various types of vascular surgery that we see in, in this group. AAA, PAD, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, and about 85% were on beta blockers and a lot of them for angina or prior MI. A good share were on statins. And the outcomes showed zero benefit of fixing the blocked arteries in stable patients. That is medical therapy was excellent in lowering perioperative risk. And there was no clear evidence of fixing the, the coronaries as a way of lowering risk. And the next slide shows you out at six years, there was no benefit. Stable ischemic heart disease on excellent medical therapy with good ejection fraction, there's no benefit of revascularization to lower perioperative risk or five-year risk. It may reduce symptoms if they have angina, but otherwise uh, it doesn't benefit them. Next slide. So here we go. Beta blockers, potential harm, aspirin, no benefit, quantity, no benefit, PA line, no benefit, PCI cabbage, no benefit, statins probably help. That is a 30 year summary of my work in this space, trying to figure out, is there anything we can do to lower perioperative risk? It's embarrassing, it's embarrassing, but we've learned a lot and I think we've gotten better. Next slide. Are we choosing wisely? No, this is a study that asks the question, how many patients are still getting a coronary angiogram before non-cardiac surgery? And if you look at that in the ACC database, 60% of the patients getting a cath were asymptomatic. When there's a financial incentive to do things, often we do things. And this I think is very, very troubling. Let's go to the next slide. Um, next slide. How long do we have to wait in a patient who's had one of the newer drug eluting stents before having elective uh, surgery. The current teaching is wait a year, but this study uh, suggests that after about six months, the risk of stent thrombosis flattens. So the European guidelines 
basically a 2A indication say it's reasonable to stop dual antiplatelet therapy in a patient who's had a PCI after six months of stability. Um, still would prefer to wait a year, but if, if you need to do the operation, six months is reasonable. Next slide. Um, I think what I'm gonna do here, just because the, 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 the interest of time, I'm gonna stop because I wanna give the audience a chance to ask me questions. I apologize for so much material. And I will send you these slides if you want them, keagle at umich.edu. There's a few more uh, slides here looking at the use of biomarkers perioperatively as well. But let me stop and see if you have questions for me. Hello. So Dr. Eagle, we have one, uh, let me see, question from uh, Dr. Abate. He's the, asking about the POIS trial is certainly troublesome. What is your practice for patients with stable coronary artery disease already on beta blockers without TEFREF or prior MI? Continue beta blockers or discontinue preoperatively? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked it. We would want to, I think, continue the beta blocker. Uh, if, if the blood pressure was soft, you know, 105 and the heart rate was 48, I might reduce the dose in half. The thing we have to be aware of is there can be a rebound tachycardia and hypertension uh, two, three, four days after sudden discontinuation of beta blockers. So we'd like to avoid that. So I generally would continue at the same dose unless they have a soft heart rate or blood pressure. And then I might cut the dose in half just to avoid this scenario. If they get bleed, if they bleed or if they get uh, septic, I, I want them to have the heart rate they may need to recover. Thank you. We, we also have a comment though. It's not a question from uh, one of our endocrinologists, Dr. Stephanie Mayer. She uh, said that it's very critical to consider aiming for significantly lowering LDL cholesterol, even below 55 milligrams per deciliter as recommended um, according to the e EAS and ECS uh, guidelines, especially if there's diabetes or any micro or macrovascular disease um, that would almost certainly require multi-agent therapy to get to those goals and uh, maxing out statins uh, uh, from what she's stating would be recommended at uh, azetamibe and uh, possibly a PCS K9 inhibitor. Yes, thank you for that. And I agree, I agree with you that uh, we want to treat these patients adequately. Uh, the trials typically used fixed doses, moderate doses, um, and showed, you know, th there's benefit, but there's clearly more benefit if they uh, get to a goal. And so I would agree in, in a high risk patient with atherosclerosis, certainly we want to get that LDL. Uh, the US guidelines currently use an LDL goal less than 70, the European guidelines less than 55. Uh, but I, I certainly want, if I'm gonna start a statin perioperatively, it's because I found atherosclerosis, they should be on statins anyway. And I'm gonna give them at least moderate, if not high dose therapy. So, um, so based on you know your um, slides towards the end, your uh, uh, statement, you know, or your summary about about the uh, uh, what we learned over the last thirty years, or what you learned during your career, how how do you see the future based on, although there was probably no benefit and potential harm to many of the things that that you looked into. Um, what is it that you think we learned the most from and, and how can we, and how can this inform uh, future treatments? Well, I, th I think that, um, you know, I've, I, I, it's really back to the bedside for me. There's, there's nothing like a great history in physical, figuring out if a patient has any indication of a significant cardiovascular disorder properly qualifying it for long-term benefit. And, and so in a way, what you, even though you're a clearance house, uh, you're kind of the point of first contact for many patients. And sometimes we find a nasty problem, whether it's aortic valve stenosis or an unsuspected cardiomyopathy or whatever. And so that you, you, you shift your focus away 
uh, from the notion of the perioperative space and say, rather, I'm trying to figure out if this patient has any cardiovascular disease. If so, how bad is it? And for the benefit of their long-term therapy, what's appropriate? Uh, and then within that context, then say, okay, now is, is it worrisome enough that they can have this operation and not worry? Or if it's elective, should we wait and try to further clarify what this heart muscle disorder is and make sure it's optimally managed before they have elective surgery? All of, of course, this all gets out the window if they're having emergency surgery, where really we're just trying to find nasty problems and, and manage those through that short time window. Um, so it's, it's back to the bedside for me, and then very selected testing, depending on what I find on a good history and physical. Dr. Hundley asked about the use of uh, troponin, and my recommendation here would be that uh, we don't want to measure biomarkers routinely. Uh, we may want to use them in patients who we have some suspicion that they've had a perioperative event, and that could be a, a run of VTAC or some unexplained hypoxia, things like that. But I'm not a fan of routine measurement of troponins or high sensitivity troponins because I think we end up in the Bayes theorem again, where we're running around looking at something that, you know, probably isn't very important. Um, and if you ask me for the slides, I have four or five slides in, in the deck here that look at troponins uh, that may be of value to the, to the learning audience today. Thank you. There's a, there's a follow-up uh, question from Dr. Abadi. Probably that would be the last one we can take. Uh, thanking you again for the excellent overview. And uh, he says, I think we have learned that perioperative MIs are not as deadly as uh, we were worried they would be. And many of the deaths are not due to MIs. Is that a fair statement? So the, yeah, thank you very much. Obviously, uh, now that we're measuring uh, troponin release with high sensitivity assays, we're seeing release of high sensitivity troponin from cardiac stress. And, and so there's an explosion of, quote, MIs after non-cardiac surgery, and many of them would not have been identified previously with traditional troponin and electrocardiographic assessment. And we know that if you run a marathon, about 10 to 12% of the finishers are going to have an elevated high sensitivity troponin. They didn't have an MI, but they had a significant cardiovascular stress. And so we really need symptoms and troponins and or EKG changes and troponins to call it an MI. And, and a good share of them are, are demand related, particularly a patient who gets hyper or hypotensive or bleeds. Um, and you're right, uh, in, the, in the old literature, MIs were MIs. Now it's all this mix of patients who we find have had a, a stressful event, but not, not necessarily a coronary plaque rupture. And so they are, they are, it's different. It's a good comment. All right, well, Dr. Eagle, thank you very much for a fantastic grand rounds. Uh, we hope uh, you have a great interaction with our uh, fellows after that. And uh, we look forward to inviting you in the future in person. That would be great. I really appreciate the chance to interact with you today. And uh, again, if you want to email me, I'll send you the slides. And any, any questions, please don't uh, be bashful about following up with me. Thank you. Okay, thanks.